Hey, everyone. Welcome to our talk. Today, we're going to be discussing how we scaled the mobile app at Chime. Our mobile app is built using React Native, and we've worked very closely with many amazing software mentioned engineers in this room right now to get to where we are today. Huge shout outs to everyone at Software Mansion for inviting us to speak today and for being such gracious hosts ever since we've arrived. Before we jump into things, let's quickly take a moment to introduce ourselves. We're both part of the mobile team at Chime. My name is George. I've been at, an engineer at Chime for two and a half years now. Prior to Chime, I was an Android engineer at Meta. Hey, all. We're going to just keep switching back and forth. Don't mind <laughs> us. Uh, I'm Jessica. I've been an engineer at Chime for the last three years. Uh, before joining Chime, I co-founded a fintech startup where we built a React Native app with ClojureScript. Now, for folks who aren't too familiar with Chime, we're one of the largest challenger banking apps operating in the United States. Our focus is on innovating new products for our members and pushing the industry forward. We've done this by eliminating a lot of fees, focusing on our members' needs, like providing additional liquidity and helping build credit scores. Now, we've been fortunate that members have found value in our product along the way, and we aren't done yet. We'd like to continue to support more features to help our members achieve financial peace of mind. In addition to growth of feature sets, we're also rapidly growing our member base. So over the past few years, we've gone from serving thousands of members to now many millions and counting. So for these millions of members here, um, the Chime mobile app is their gateway into seeing and accessing their money. With that in mind, availability, as you can imagine, is incredibly important to maintain here. So to be precise, oh, sorry. Uh, availability um, here, what does it mean? So for us, availability is the ability of our members to access the information and resources they need when they need it. So th what's the problem here then? What are the challenges to maintain high availability at Chime as we continue to scale? So as we continue to grow more features, you can imagine the code complexity actually increases. And as we continue to support more members, um, the increase in the load on our system also goes up. All this is basically a recipe for lower availability, which is not so great. Um, so today we'll talk through a sample app that in some ways is a simplified version of our Chime app. Um, through this sample app, we'll actually show in more detail about the problems we faced while scaling and also talk about three things we did to address these problems. One, we'll go through how GraphQL was used to simplify the client logic and reduce the volume of requests. And we'll also go through how feature isolation um, was used to protect the most critical information for our members. And we'll talk through three, how we created light mode, um, a new mode we created to respond to outages when feature isolation and other things we did didn't quite work or wasn't enough there. Cool. So this is our fine app. Right now, it's in its early stages, and it's incredibly simple. As you can see, all we support is a single screen showing your checking account. For your checking account, we show your balance and your transactions. We fetch all this data through a single REST endpoint using the checking account endpoint, and that's served by our backend. Things are going great right now, but we want to expand our scope, and we want to support even more features. So let's say we want to introduce a savings account. We also want to show the user their profile settings, and we want to build out other additional features. Each of these new features makes separate REST requests to our backend to grab the data needed to render its UI. That means we also need to scale our backend services to support these additional requests. Therefore, we've decided to adopt a microservice architecture with a single routing layer. For the different microservices, you can imagine a banking service that serves bank data, such as the balance and transactions, or a user service responsible for the user information, and so on. With all these changes in place, the complexity has grown significantly on both the client and the server. Now, let's see how the system holds up under millions of requests. All right. So take all the code complexity we've introduced above and now pair it with a huge volume of incoming requests and what can end up happening. System resources get overloaded, bottlenecks are exposed, any internal service failing will cause a subset of client requests to fail. Because the client code has gotten so complex, 
This will likely cause loading screen to fail. Then multiply this by millions of clients, and we have a pretty serious outage on our hands. That's the opposite of availability. As we've scaled both the number of features we support and the number of members we serve, you can start to see how things break down. So what can we do to prioritize availability for our members? So to prioritize availability, let's start with taking a look at our REST request patterns. Um, we'll talk about how GraphQL can help us both simplify the code complexity and reduce the volume of requests we're sending to our back end. When using the REST pattern, we had to make four separate requests in this example to fetch the data for our app, since our REST endpoints are very data model driven. To illustrate what we mean by data model driven, let's take a look at these endpoints. So first we fetch the slash widgets endpoint to get the sorted list of widgets um, and that we want to show on the screen. We can also pass additional information like the title back. Then only once that response comes back, um, we'll, every widget will fetch its own endpoint uh, to populate the widget data. So as you can see, we make subsequent requests for checking account, savings account, and user info. This data model-driven pattern often leads to overfetching request data that won't end up being used. So in the example of the checking account, you can see we return the routing number, or in the example of the profile widget, when we fetch user info, we return the address and the email, none of which are rendered on the screen. It also leads to an unnecessary volume in requests to our backend services across multiple layers. At the routing layer, you can see that we send a number of requests for one screen, and that number of requests will continue to grow depending on how many new features we continue to add here. Now, GraphQL, on the other hand, allows us to return everything the client needs in a single request and to minimize the number of round trips we need to make. In addition, we designed the schema based on client needs instead of the server-side data model. As you can see from the GraphQL query on the left, we have subfields within the widgets endpoint to pull information on the account widgets and the profile widget. The single query helps simplify the client code complexity, where we don't need to make the multiple requests to the backend anymore. So let's take a look at what's happening under the hood here. So over here, a single request is made over to our routing layer. We then have the backend handle the necessary fan out to microservices instead of the client needing to stitch everything together. The backend will then return to the client the aggregate response of what we need in order to render the widgets on our fine app. Through this one GraphQL query, the backend will only return what we need instead of sending all the extra data model information, like the routing number or the user email or whatnot. And now, instead of having the mobile app send multiple requests through, we actually just send a single GraphQL request and let the backend handle that fan out. There are multiple reasons for why we chose GraphQL, but for purpose of this presentation, we won't dive into all those benefits here. Um, instead, for this talk, we mostly want to highlight how we're able to use GraphQL to simplify the client code complexity and reduce the volume of requests to our backend in order to help us scale. So we were able to accomplish a lot by switching over to our one single GraphQL request. However, it is possible within a GraphQL request where one failing field errors the entire request or one slow resolver delays the entire request. In this example here, let's say that our user service is erroring out, and therefore, we cannot obtain user profile data. When this happens, the entire screen is unable to load. All the widgets are now displaying an error, and we're no longer able to show the member their balances and transactions, which are critical pieces of data for a banking application. That's not fine. We need to make sure that even with user service failing, we can continue to show critical banking data to our members. We've approached this problem in a variety of ways, including graceful error handling, typed errors, and feature isolation. Today, we'll talk a little bit more about feature isolation. So how we implemented feature isolation is by splitting our one single query into two separate ones. One query contains critical member information, such as the balance of the transactions, while the other contains non-critical information, such as the user info. Our most critical features are now isolated from failures that may occur with the less critical features. As you can see in the UI, even if user service is failing, balances and transactions are still able to return successfully. 
our app can continue to display the most critical information through the account widgets, even while the profile widget is still in an error state. Overall, this is a much better experience than when we displayed an error for everything. There are other ways to achieve feature isolation. However, we found that splitting queries is the simplest and most resilient. Another benefit for splitting our queries is allowing us to implement traffic prioritization on the back end. Our back end recognizes these two query operation names, in this case, critical query and non-critical query, and it can assign a priority to each one. As you may guess, critical query is high priority, while non-critical query is low priority. Our automated traffic prioritization algorithm knows to shed low priority requests based on the available resources on the server. In this example, if we're experiencing elevated load, we can now shed all the low priority requests in favor of the high priority ones. So to summarize, with feature isolation, we're now able to prioritize critical banking information for our members in a variety of ways. So we've talked about feature isolation and traffic prioritization. Both of these work in tandem to help us avoid most outages. Some outages, they're still unavoidable, however, so that's why we created this new mode of the app that we're calling light mode. Light mode is gonna help us gracefully degrade the user experience and communicate with members and recover our backends gracefully. So let's take a look at an, at an example where there's a prolonged outage and everything is failing here. The automated error experience with feature isolation works great for intermittent issues. However, for prolonged outages, we'll dive into a couple concerns. One, as a member, why is the current experience, why can that result in a loss of trust for our members and how do we address that? And two, from our backend services, if something does go wrong that results in a prolonged outage, how do we keep our services resilient and protect it from getting hammered with requests? We've created this light mode of our app, which can be used to both put the app in a graceful state for our members and also protect our backend services. All right, so let's take a look at concern number one. How does light mode help with the member experience here? From this default error experience, Seeing these errors won't be reassuring after a long period of time. A member has no way of knowing when their app will recover, they're just shown generic error messages throughout the screen, and they don't even know if we're aware of that there are issues. This can ultimately lead to a very frustrated member as they continually try to refresh the app. We've all been in that situation at some point, we, you know what we're talking about here. With light mode, we try to create a much more graceful app experience during these prolonged outages. So as you can see from the screenshot, we have a message up top with the ability to, to communicate with our members. We can reassure members that their account is safe, that we're actively working on a resolution here. Also within this mode, we have the ability to control whether or not we show these cash balances, cash transactions. This view is a lot more calming for our members than the prior view with all the error messages everywhere. Now, in order to ensure availability of light mode, we want to keep it simple. So we chose to set it up on a back-end infrastructure, reason being for some outages, it may not even be possible to reach our primary infrastructure. And now because it uses a separate one, we're keeping it simple so that light mode is controlled by just a JSON file hosted on a CDN. This way, even if our primary info is down, our mobile app can still pull the necessary data it needs in order to activate light mode. This JSON data, as you can see on the bottom right, it includes information about what messaging we want to show at the top, whether or not we want to enable the cash transactions and the cash balances. Now, we've covered how light mode can help with our member experience. Let's dive into how we also use light mode to recover from outages safely from our backend services. All right, as you may remember, our backend services are completely down. Members are currently seeing an error state on the app. As a natural instinct, a lot of them will still want to try to continually refresh the app, leading to actually an additional volume of requests getting sent to our backend. This will prevent our backend from recovering as easily and as safely when it's getting hammered with requests. So to give our backend services a little bit more breathing room, we can actually short circuit requests from our mobile app to reduce traffic when light mode is activated. Now, once our system starts recovering, 
We then want to be able to slowly introduce requests to go through until the backend services are fully recovered. So in order to do so, we don't want this to just be a Boolean toggle. Rather, we want it to be a dial from 0 to 100% that we can control. All right, so right now, app enabled is set to 0. As we start seeing things slowly recover, we can start allowing requests to go through so that they can start firing. Now, once the recovery is confirmed on our backend services, and you can see the cloud is now in a happy state, we can fully enable the app and restore the member experience from light mode. Now, you can imagine you can add further co configurations within light mode along the way to control different parts of the app, like you can just disable savings account or just disable if you have like five other screens elsewhere. Um, this control with light mode lets us safely scale the app up while ensuring our backend services don't topple over, ultimately keeping us available for our members. So to summarize takeaways, today we've talked about how GraphQL is great for bundling requests and simplifying the client, how we use feature isolation to protect critical features for our members, and why we built light mode, mode and how it allows us to respond to inevitable outages that may arise despite other preventions. All these items work in tandem to make sure that the Chime app is both a fine and available experience for our members. Thanks for listening in. Please find us at Chime on Twitter.